Good tidings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Landy Lodge podcast. Before we launch this episode, we have some special people we need to thank, those special people being the sages of the lodge, those who donate monthly to keep the lodge moving. If you'd like to become a sage of the lodge by donating as little as a dollar a month, you can find a link in the episode description, be it whether it's on YouTube or any of the audio platforms. So, Thank you to everybody, thank you to the Sages of the Lodge, and thank you for tuning in. And without further ado, let's get on with it. Beautiful ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Landy Lodge podcast, where today I bring you, I promise, very interesting guests coming up in the Kingdom Hearts scene, the Kingdom Minds podcast, and I don't want to take any more airtime than I need to. If you guys would please introduce yourselves and let them know what is the Kingdom Minds podcast. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Go, go ahead, Karis. <laughs> My name is Karis. Uh, so, yeah, um, we host the Kingdom Minds podcast. So, it is a show and we talk a lot about Kingdom Hearts primarily. But also, we chat a lot about the spiritual themes within Kingdom Hearts as it relates to our Christian faith. So that's kind of what we're about. Um, but yeah, it's a good time. It's a good time. Yeah, and uh, my name is David, and um, of course, uh, I love I love the combination. Uh, I love the the meeting of minds when it comes to pop culture and and Christianity because I think there's a lot. Um, a lot of times a lot of overlap there that I think people don't uh, realize. Yeah, I would definitely agree. And it's one of the reasons why I was so compelled to your guys' podcast. Um, and I just want to, I'll be as open with you guys as I am with the audience. Uh, I'm a very hopeful agnostic. I was raised Christian, um, mm -hmm. but that's just where I am now. With that said, I don't think you need to be like a Christian or a spiritual person to find these ideas fascinating and to find them intriguing, whether it in, entails Kingdom Hearts or in their, you know, in their base form. Um, so listen, if, if you're listening to this and, you know, whatever side of the aisle you're on, if you're a Christian, if you're an agnostic, if you're an atheist, that doesn't mean that this conversation isn't for you. And that doesn't mean that we can't have a good time. So with that out of the way, with yeah. that out of the way. Um, I always bring this up because I swear it was the first episode I listened to for you guys um, mm -hmm. where you touched on Aqua in the Realm of Darkness yes. and how that um, has an overlap with Christ's journey through the desert. And I just mm. thought that was so profound. So I would really love it if we could just talk about a bunch of stuff like that today. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think there's a lot of that in Kingdom Hearts. I think there's a lot of really like overt references like the stained glass windows, Kingdom Hearts being an obvious analogy to heaven, the realm of darkness being an obvious analogy to hell. Um, but I think there's maybe more, and I don't know how much of it was intentional or not, but I think, and I, you've talked about the hero's journey before, uh, so much of those types of stories uh, that follow those strong archetypes uh, really harken back to the Bible, um, to the, you know, you start in a place of like paradise, uh, so I think of the first Kingdom Hearts game, uh, Destiny Island is literally a type of kind of paradise. Mm. Uh, but then there's something missing, right? Something goes wrong. Riku <clears throat> opens the realm to darkness. Uh, and then the rest of the, the journey is trying to get back to that somehow. And then, of course, at the end of Kingdom Hearts 1, uh, the Destiny Islands and the worlds are uh, were lost to darkness are restored. Uh, and so the similar, same thing is the Bible. You have the Garden of Eden. But man sins and darkness enters into the world, sin enters into the world. And at the end of the Bible, you have the book of Revelation where uh, the Garden of Eden comes down from heaven onto the earth with the tree of life that was lost uh, at the beginning. So you have that full circle type mm -hmm. of story. And the whole mm -hmm. story in between is, is what are the main characters doing to, uh, to, to fix that initial problem that has been, that has been caused? So you definitely see a lot of that in Kingdom Hearts, um, a lot of strong hero archetypes, uh, especially Sora. Uh, he he plays that that Messiah figure more than once, uh, I think, in the series. Oh yeah, I think multiple times of kind of sacrificing himself 
for the sake of his friends so that uh, they can gain back what they lost. Yeah, uh, I want to dig into your Destiny Islands example. Do you think the Pow Pow fruit might have any overlap with the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, that sort of like original <laughs> sin? Could it be? Because I think in Destiny Islands, that Pow Pow fruit is about Sora not wanting to be separated from Kyrie, And in many ways, that's a desire of his. It leaves him wanting. You right. Know, like it's a it's a thing of knowledge that knocks him out of paradise a little bit. Do you think do you think that overlap is there? Yeah, no, I'm not sure about the, that. But the, so the specific of the analogy of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the papar fruit. I do think that fruit in and of itself is a strong archetype, maybe something closer to the tree of life. OK, uh, I would say. But I would say the analogy for the um, uh, the knowledge of good and evil would be Riku wanting to leave the island to begin with, um, yes. kind of more for selfish reasons than really for the benefit of others. Right. I was just about to bring that up as well, because like that that picture of Riku standing like this and he's like got his hand open, right? So mm -hmm. it's very much yeah. like, yo, come with me, like check out this thing that I found. And so that mm -hmm. kind of reminds me a lot of like, because Eve eats oh, the yeah. fruit first, right? right? And then she offers it to Adam. So it's kind of this thing where um, he's fallen into that darkness. He's chosen to to take that upon himself to um, uh, to do the crazy thing. And then he's like, Sora, like, try it out. Like, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah. So I don't know. Maybe that's something that just yeah. came to me <laughs> just there. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of funny how those ideas will just pop up as you're talking about them. But I think that's part of what's made, at least for so many people, I feel like I more often hear Riku is their favorite character as opposed to someone maybe like Sora, because we've all been in Riku's shoes. We've all been mm -hmm. tempted and we've all had our moments of darkness, whereas Sora just, he kind of seems to know how to roll with it. He, you know, from the beginning, his heart has always kind of known what's right, whereas Riku is a little bit more human and he's more flawed like we are. And I've always found that so interesting. And mm -hmm. it explains to me at least why he's seemingly the more compelling between the two. I think so. And I think his journey as well, where he starts out and then like where he where he comes to now, it's a really beautiful picture, I think, of like restoration. And um, to me anyway, it just reminds me of like what Jesus can do like in a person's life, like how they can take them from this thing and renew that like completely and I think that's really beautiful and um but I mean he he learns lots of different things like along the way and I don't know that's really cool but I think it's similar um as well like because you mentioned about Aqua at the start um and I think that's like almost a very similar journey I feel like but I feel like hers is more um it, it's less about the temptation of like to do the dark thing and it's more about just like depression and like, how do I get that hope back in my life that I had at the start? Um, which I don't know. I just think it's, it's interesting I, how those things are both in there. And I think part of Aqua's flaw too is her, you know, uh, overprotection. She was almost, almost kind of like an overprotective mother or sister, more motherly towards Ven, more sisterly towards Tara, I don't want to say that because I know there's a ship there. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to mix that up. But you, you, you guys get what I mean. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think with uh, going off what you said about Riku, uh, I do think it is very much an analogy for uh, the Christian life for somebody who was once in darkness. And of course, the Bible used that analogy of darkness a lot as well. Uh, if you think of Isaiah, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light, uh, which mm -hmm. is often quoted at Christmas time. Mm -hmm. uh, the beginning of the gospel of John as well. Uh, but the analogy in scripture is that we were once in darkness, but that uh, putting your faith in Christ uh, illuminates your life or, or brings you into the light. And that's very yeah. much Riku's journey is that he once walked in darkness, but because of the kindness shown to him by others and the sacrifice of others, he was able to come out of that, particularly Sora kind of relentlessly pursuing him no matter how much Riku pushed him away. Uh, and that is very much a picture of how God uh, relentlessly pursues us, uh, mm. even though we're not seeking him. We're not, uh, you know, our minds are just like, yeah, I don't, I don't I really care. I just want to do my own thing. And, and, I, and, and God is the one who's reaching out to us, uh, changing our hearts and, and making us to something new. 
And that's really cool, right? Because I know a lot, a lot of people are interpreting as Sora is almost like this embodiment of Kingdom Hearts itself. I mean, we haven't seen that in plain English given to us, mm -hmm. but I don't think anyone would be surprised if that's where we end up. Uh, yeah. I want to run an idea by you guys. Give a quick shout out to my friend Andy Brew, who put this idea in my head. Speaking of Riku's particular journey, um, mm -hmm. he brings up that Mickey is actually the Christ figure to him, you know, like King mm. Mickey, like that's the light on his shoulder, like when he's going through chain of memories and he feels oh, yeah. alone and he's being intimidated by Ansem, but then Mickey comes in like the form of a light just to like be by his side and sort of vanquish that darkness out of him. Um, you know, Mickey was able to be there for him in a way Sora wasn't. Yeah. Um, I always, I feel like that lined up. I always thought that was a really, you know, profound way of you know, as he calls it, the gospel according to Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I feel like, yeah, I feel like that fits as well because um, I think there's different people like that reflect Jesus like in reality as well. Like you can meet a person and be like, yo, like you, I don't know, like the way that, that it's you- It's a pattern look. of being, right? Like right. a spirit is a pattern of being. Yes. And like the way that you, your relationship with, with Jesus just like radiates from you. And like, that can be like a light in a person's life as well. Like that relationship with somebody else. So yeah, mm -hmm. I feel like there can be lots of different people that are lights, you know, mm -hmm. and that's a thing in Kingdom Hearts <laughs> as well. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. know. So I, I think, think that's it, a cool theory. Yeah, that is a cool thing. I hadn't thought of that before, but it definitely makes sense. Um, I think Kingdom Hearts reminds me a lot also of Lord of the Rings in the sense yeah. that there are those strong archetypes, but it's not like a one-to-one -one allegory. Uh, yes. it's, it's just, uh, these are these are themes that permeate the lore and the story uh, of the world. So, you know, in Lord of the Rings, there are multiple Christ-type figures uh, that represent different aspects of Christ. Um, Aragorn being kind of Christ the king, Gandalf being like a prophet, uh, and Frodo being like Christ the priest. Um, and you see it on the other side too, right? Because Sauron is like the embodiment of the devil. How's that? <laughs> that now I, I, cards on the table, I've like half watched Lord of the Rings. It's not something I'm very much into, but Sauron is the big red eye, right? Or do I have the name? Oh, Sauron, oh, Sauron. Sauron. I you said Sauron. Sauron. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm Sauron. trying to say. Yeah, I thought you said Sora as well. I'm no, like, not oh. Sora. No. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. I got you. Okay, we're on the same page. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's why we were both confused. Like, yeah, because part of it, I was like, he's okay. like, I was like, what do you mean? He's like the big evil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and all three That's of funny. them. Uh, Frodo, Gandalf, and Aragorn all have their own kind of death and resurrection uh, type of story where uh, Gandalf literally dies and comes back to life, but Aragorn goes to the underground to the realm of the dead and comes back, uh, and Frodo gets stung by Shelob, and we think he's dead, but then he, he comes back. Why is that idea so powerful and popular? The idea of a character like dying and walking through the realm of the dead to make their way back. Like what, what is it about that idea that we've spent thousands of years like throwing it back at ourselves over and over? Mm. Yeah, I think it's interesting, you know, when Tolkien, Tolkien and Lewis were friends, Tolkien, of course, author of Lord of the Rings, C.S. Lewis, the author of the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, C.S. Lewis started out as an atheist um, and then became a theist and then became a Christian. Uh, and he was good friends with J.R. Tolkien. And, and one day they were talking and, and Lewis was telling Tolkien, he said, well, you know, Christ, he's just one of many myths. I mean, there's all these types of myths of, of the God who, become, who comes down and, and dies and then rises again. And Tolkien uh, told him, he said, well, you're right. He is a myth, but he's also, he's, he's a myth that, be, that came true. Mm -hmm. And so I think, think there is a deep longing in all of us uh, to see that fulfilled. And I think on the one hand, it's because uh, Karis and I believe that it is uh, because it's a reality, it's a truth. And so our stories uh, resonate with us when they start to touch on that reality, uh, mm. that greater reality that we're a part of. Uh, and also just, I think we also have that indwelling or underlying need for a savior. There's something inside us that says, I know there's something wrong with me and I can't fix it by myself. I need an outside force to do it for me. And it has to be, and it has to, and, and it's more moving the greater the, the, the sacrifice is that has to be done. Like if somebody, uh, you know, 
sacrifices 10 bucks for you. That's not a big deal. It's not going to move you. But they sacrifice their whole life savings for you. Uh, that's a powerful story, right? Mm -hmm. So that yeah. sacrifice is something I find very... Were you going to say something, Karis? I don't want to interrupt. No. Okay. Carry okay. on. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> I was just going to say, sacrifice is another one that's that's very powerful. Um, yeah. You know, so, sometimes when I think about it, it's like, I feel like sacrifices are the only actual choices we have. Like, I believe in free will, but I think the most powerful choices we make are what we're going to sacrifice, when and why. Like the idea of sacrifice is a very powerful thing. And, you know, it's something you see in Kingdom Hearts over and over and over and over again. You can't play a Kingdom Hearts game without there being some kind of sacrifice in there. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. What if particular I sacrifice? Sa the sword or the staff or the shield. <laughs> yeah, yeah, even in the, exactly, even in the very beginnings of the game. Um, is there a particular sacrifice in the Kingdom Hearts story that has stuck with you guys? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> there's a lot. There's so many. Uh, I don't want to say. Eesh, I don't know. Like, okay. I feel like. I feel like Sora going through um, it like in Remind when he goes back for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. um, because like when I was playing it the first time, I was like, he's using the power of waking in this like really crazy like reckless way and like he doesn't know how he's gonna come back from that but he's doing it anyway and he's saving everybody like in the process <laughs> it's crazy um and i was just like bro <laughs> why is he so good um but like i don't know you just see him do that over and over again like hey like with people he just meets and he's like yo i'll, I'll go and i'll fight your battles and what have you and I think that's really cool and I don't know. I think that we the reason we like these games so much is because we're like we all need a Sora. We all need someone, right? And like mm -hmm. th like even Lord of the Rings like to go back to that. Um but like in the end when you know Sam is carrying Frodo up Mount Doom and all that. Like that I tear up every <laughs> time I watch this because I'm like we all need somebody. Like we all need that person um and i feel like that that's that's why that sticks with me yeah i don't know yeah i think sort of sacrifice for Kairi the first game i think was because i was like i think the first one I really saw i think when i first played it we were like oh like what yeah. like i'm heartless now what? <laughs> what's going on yeah, I think it's his willingness to like give it all up without any sort of plan of coming back, right? Like when he sacrificed mm -hmm. himself for Kyrie, he doesn't know how heartless work. I mean, they make fun of Sora all the time for how like clueless he can be. He doesn't know how any of this stuff works. He doesn't really know how power of waking works. He just knows it's a means that he can save the ones he loves. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, you know, I agree a lot with what you guys said. I think it's true. We all need somebody. I think, you know, hearts are stronger when connected. You know, it's it's very telling, right? What it's are you, are you guys familiar with Dante's Inferno? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I haven't, I, like, I haven't read the whole thing, but I, I know a lot about it. The idea I took the most from it is like uh, when he makes his way to the pit of hell, it's made of ice. And like mm -hmm. at the bottom of hell is betrayal. And what is always going on with like the foretellers, the organization, everybody mm -hmm. on this darkness side, it's like they can't even help themselves. There's always this betrayal. Like everyone, like everyone's playing these these games of who can climb the ladder. Whether you're looking at you know Marluxia and Larxene trying to betray, uh, whether you have the Book of Prophecies traitor with the foretellers, and you know Ased accusing Gula and Gula accusing Ased. It um, I've always found that to be a very powerful idea, and I think that's one Kingdom Hearts. This idea of a traitor, and I mean we've even seen it in the last Union Cross update, mm -hmm. is is. It really resonates with the darkness. And I always thought that was a really cool idea that there's a lot of evil, sinful things you can do in this world, but at the mm. very bottom is like betraying someone you love. Right. Yeah. And I think that's really interesting because I, um, I, d I didn't get to listen to all of it, uh, but your most recent uh, podcast that you did about the universe update, like um, there's a moment where you're all talking about like, the different darknesses and they've like oh what if they have different names and i was like mm -hmm. what and then i was like this is crazy because it's almost like 
Uh, and now, of course, we know that darkness is like an entity or many entities. I don't know. Uh, this like a hive, hive mind, mind entity. Yeah, but it's like it's like all of a sudden, before we thought that darkness was just like a force mm-hmm. or like it it's just there, right? But right. now it's like darkness has personality. Like darkness is like a person or many <laughs> people, and so that's like wild to me, um, because like even in like the bible like there's lots of different instances where like jesus speaks to people like he speaks to like demons or whatever and they like answer him like they've got mm-hmm. like a personality um and so i don't know um but of course like betrayal is like a huge thing because obviously you know judas betraying jesus and all that yeah there um, it is mm-hmm. so i think that comes into play and i feel like yeah i mean i i don't um I think it's bad theology to be like one sin's worse than another. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't. I don't think that. But um, I do think that there is something about that. Um, yeah, betraying somebody that's just like, yeah, it's hard. Well, it's hard to come back from that when yeah. you burn that bridge. I mean, I do feel like the beautiful thing about Kingdom Hearts is that there is also forgiveness yes. and redemption yep. and restoration. Um, people like Riku coming back. Uh, and and even Ansem the Wise and the Radiant yes, Garden Gang. Absolutely, like, of course. Yeah. Um, and like they don't even really seem to question it, which I think is awesome. I think that's mm-hmm. really beautiful. Um, but yeah, like it's, I think, yeah, it's hard. It takes time. Yeah. <laughs> I think that ultimate idea of resurrection that uh, we need to see people come back somehow, uh, that, hit, that, that hits, I think, at something that. Uh, that we know instinctively that we're not supposed to die. Like if death is just a natural part of the world, we should not, we shouldn't cry at funerals. We should be like, it, it would be like a birthday or like- A birth graduation. by sleep maybe? Yeah, <laughs> but, but it, it would be, it wouldn't be like, a, like this heart wrenching, like I've lost this person. It would be like, oh, well, you know, that's just the next stage. You, you live and then you die and that's it. Right, it's not like a big deal, but I think the reason why we cry at death uh, and and we 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 want to see our loved ones uh, here and with us is because we know instinctively that's not the way things are supposed to be, and uh, I, I like the way that Kingdom Hearts kind of gets at that and and even you know has a compelling story where characters are resurrected where it doesn't feel like you're cheating so much or it doesn't feel like it's hokey. Um, like you, you know, characters can come back, but you gotta do some stuff to get. There's a cost. Back. Yeah, there's a cost to it. Like you said, sacrifice. We got everyone back, but then we lost Sora. Right. Right. Gone forever. Go. <laughs> let's, well, let's hope not. <laughs> let's hope we can get him back. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about was the final world. Um, mm. This is a very interesting realm. Uh, in Kingdom Hearts, and I can't help but think of like a purgatory realm. Um, do you guys? And I know the the rules aren't quite the same. I know, um, but I believe the way the final world works, um, it's if you're holding on to some someone or something tight enough, hearts kind of get stationed there until they're ready to move on. Is, is that something that's been drawn out of like the purgatory concept of the Bible, or do you think that more closely relates to something else? Uh, it probably is somewhat inspired by purgatory. Um, purgatory is not really in the Bible. It's uh, part of Catholic tradition. Shows how much I know. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> I think a, you know, a lot of people assume that that it is something uh, from the Bible, but uh, it's not, you know, either. Uh, I think it says it's appointed unto man once to die and then comes the judgment. Mm. And so it's either heaven or hell. Um, I, but it is interesting. Uh, it does have, it, the final world seems to be like it's trying to be like the the last world you get to before you go to heaven kind mm-hmm. of thing like it's like it, even like with the the way it looks like it's just like clouds and like an ocean and it's like you know if you just go one step above this you're in heaven basically <laughs> mm-hmm. mm, yeah i don't really know anything about purgatory whatsoever there you go it's not I guess I'm showing my colors. I was, like I mentioned earlier, I was raised, I said I was raised Christian, but more specifically, I was raised Catholic. So that might explain why I've got that idea looming probably. around here. Yeah, probably. 
Who knows? Who knows? Um, <laughs> um, but is there any, are there any other like sort of uh, overlaps that we haven't touched on yet that you guys want to talk about? Uh, I mean, there's just so many, um, you know, the, the, the fact that heartless can come from anybody, meaning that everybody has darkness in their hearts. Uh, that's a biblical concept that we're all born uh, with sin. Um, yeah. Jeremiah says that the heart is uh, desperately wicked and deceitful. Who can know it? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And so um, th that's a very powerful idea within Christianity. And, and that's part of the reason why all of us need salvation, that we're, we're not able to simply climb up a ladder of rules uh, mm -hmm. to get to heaven ourselves, that we need God to reach down and grab us and pull us up. Yeah. Something else that I think is really interesting. Um, yeah, it's a really good point. Actually, um, you know, darkness inside everybody, and that's sort of how heartless come around. Mm -hmm. Completely other direction. But um, I think replicas are super interesting for Ooh. many reasons. Um, but one of them that I think is fascinating is like the idea that we are whole people. Um, and like you can't exist without a body. And like that is something that's um um that's a really important thing in the Bible as well because like like Jesus when he came to earth like he was fully human the he was flesh. also fully God right yeah. but he was also fully human and um and so that's how we can understand what God is like is through mm. Jesus um but similarly like we um we are like whole people so we are we have physical bodies we have the soul we have um we we have we have the mind sorry and the spirit as well so we need like all three of those to be like real so mm -hmm. it's not enough that you know um you know shiana or roxas or whoever just exists like inside sora's heart like that because they can and i love that they never accepted that they're like that's yes. not good enough you no. know yeah. um they need to be their own person i think that's yeah. really cool i think that's a really positive like I also like that uh, that they couldn't just put Roxas in the data world and be like, well, you can just hang out with your data world buddies. It's like, <laughs> no, 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 you need like actual The people. real, the genuine um, article. Yeah. Yeah, and I think sometimes people get this a little bit wrong about Christianity. Sometimes I think that, that Christianity or the Bible teaches that like the material world is bad and, and we need, right. we're just kind of souls trapped in bodies that need to escape and that when we get to heaven, we're just going to be these floating ethereal creatures uh, that are like transparent or something. Uh, but that's totally the opposite of really what the Bible teaches, that God made the world in Genesis and it said it was very good, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Christians look forward to a bodily resurrection, not uh, not floating in heaven as spirits. Uh, right. That's and, why Christ's body wasn't, wasn't found. His body was gone too with his resurrection. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I'll, and, I'll, yeah the go Bible ahead, calls go him. Yeah, I just say the Bible calls him the firstborn of the dead. So he's a he's a foreshadow of what we of what Christians can expect as well. That's so epic. <laughs> I just think that's so epic. Yeah. Um, let me ask you one thing. I've always, one overlap. I think I see, and you guys let me know. You keep me in check. All right. You're, fam <laughs> <laughs> are you familiar with the Cain and Abel story? Yes. I yeah. see a lot of overlap between Sora and Riku in Kingdom Hearts 1 there. Mm. You know, if I could like Sora would be Abel, Riku would be Kane. Riku sees, oh, Sora's eight. He's holding the Keyblade, wielding the Keyblade. He can't. Oh, we both left the islands and look, Sora's made all these friends and Maleficent's, you know, on Riku's shoulder. Like, oh, look, he's already moved on without you, mm. made all these new friends and here you are alone. Um, whereas I feel like the story with Kane was he eventually became like, so isolated and sort of got possessed by his darkness and sought out to kill his brother. Whereas Abel, as I said, was doing God's work, you know, the, the key, mm -hmm. which you could see as the key blade or kingdom hearts. Mm -hmm. Am I, am I circle in the drain? Am I on the money here? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. I think that's a really, um, really cool analogy actually. Um, but yeah, the sad thing about, <laughs> about the Cain and Abel story is that there's no kind of like resolution to like, Kate's it's it's, it's a he's, tragedy you have to learn yeah, from but he's you kind know of yeah. just wandering around as like a nomad forever <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> yeah, so. not the happiest of endings, but I feel like that those stories always resonate with me because they they there's something very real in us, right? Like when I was younger, I mean, I still, I, I'm a musician, I played guitar, I still do. But when I was first learning, you know, I had a friend who was also learning guitar and I, I love this friend dearly, I really do. But when he got like a league better than me, there was some part of me that was like, you know, it, it almost felt like a darkness in me was like, oh, now I'm jealous. I hate that he's a little bit better than me. When like, right. that is not that is not the right response. The right response is, oh my God, let me ask him for tips. How, how did you step up that league? You're like, you know, he's my friend. I love him. He loves me. It was not a problem. But that, that story always resonates with me because I feel like there's something very human in us where we almost have to keep that part of us in check. You know, even if someone is your brother, if they're doing something better than you or just having success when you haven't found it yet, you have to learn to silence that part of you, not silence, mm -hmm. maybe not silence, but keep in check that part of you or else you're going to end up like Cain and Abel. You'll, you'll both, you know, it won't, it won't end well. Yeah. That's true. And it's wild yeah. how like we're, we've not like evolved from that at all. Like we're, <laughs> like we're still the same people like we go through that mm -hmm. same thing and i think like even now like th that's like its rawest form right now it's like social media and like watching other people online and being like look how many followers they have and like i've only got however many what have mm -hmm. you um and i feel like yeah like i mean it's um it's a pretty accurate yeah. Yeah, i think... for yeah Riku looking yeah. at sora and being like yo my man's I think the more powerful it, tools we have. What's up with that? Yeah. <laughs> what have I got? I don't know. Yeah, it's true. I think so. <laughs> yeah, I think the more powerful tools that we have to do good, uh, it also kind of amplifies the evil within us as well. So it's like, you know, the internet is such a good and powerful thing. And at the same time, it just like brings out the worst in people at the same time. You know, it really does. And uh, there's a line that really sticks with me um, that the line between good and evil runs down the human heart. You know, you can have oh, the, yeah. most, the most mm -hmm. powerful tools ever known to man, the internet, smartphones, computers in your pocket for, you know, it's like you can have all of this, but whether or not it's a benefit or detrimental is going to come down to the individual. And I yes, think that's what makes right. a lot of these stories and these archetypes powerful is it's all about the empowerment of the individual. It's like none of us can none of us can hope to save the world with our own individual actions. Really, mm -hmm. the best we can do is mm -hmm. is try to save ourselves, and you know, and through that, be a model that other people can emulate to you know further spread those seeds of light through the world. Yeah, uh, that that's that's what I take from a lot of these stories that I think is just very powerful. Absolutely. And I feel like yeah. um, that's universal to everybody and like not just people that believe what we believe. But of course. Um, yeah, uh, just to like explain a little bit like the, the whole Cain and Newell story, because I feel like you did a good job. But like just for people who might not know. Right. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. keep me in check. Keep me in check. Bridge <laughs> version. Right. OK, so <laughs> although David's better at teaching the Bible than me, but we'll get we'll get there. OK, so. Yeah, basically they're trying to make a sacrifice to the Lord. So that's kind of the scenario. So Cain does crops. He grows agriculture. Ugh. Yeah, he does ag agriculture. <laughs> <laughs> and then Abel like rears the cattle and the sheep and things like that. So then they make these sacrifices and Cain brings like his crops, but he doesn't bring the best. He brings like an okay amount. It's like, whatever. Um, and then Abel brings like the best of what he's got, right? So then they're sort of, they're both there on the altar and God consumes Abel's sacrifice and does not consume Cain's sacrifice because God sees that it's about the heart um, that Abel gave the best that he could, that he really cared, that it mattered to him. Whereas Cain was like, yeah, well, I'll just do this, you know, so God will bless me. So I feel like that's, to do with the intention um and i feel like yeah. that's sort of where uh where riku and sora's journey really deviates from the start is like because they both kind of have the same goal they're like yeah we want to get off this island and we want to do our own thing but riku is like yeah i i want to he's always trying to compete with sora and like be better than him and things like that where sora is more about I'm here with my friends and we're doing this. Sora's more cooperative while Riku's more competitive. He's more pure in heart, yeah. I would say. 
I don't know, <laughs> but I feel like that is a cool analogy. So I would take a slightly different uh, view of the Cain and Abel story um, because it doesn't tell us exactly why God accepted Abel's offering and not Cain's. So Abel brought from his flock and Cain brought from uh, his harvest. Um, mm -hmm. I would say it's the nature of sacrifice um, that there has to be a blood sacrifice to atone for sin. Um, but, you know, God tells Cain, he says, why are, why are you, why are you, uh, why are you sad? He says, why is your face down? He says, uh, if you just do what is right, you will be accepted. So in other words, he says, it's okay. Like you can just bring one of Abel's offerings and you'll be fine. Um, but it was more of like, no, I want to do it my way. Right. Like, I want you, I want to force you to accept my offering. Mm -hmm. and if you don't accept what I want to give you, then it's your fault, God, not, not mine. And God was like, look, you could just ask your brother for a sheep. If he, he'd give it to you. It's like, it's, it's totally fine. Um, but again, you know, that, that pride gets in the way. And I think similarly, you know, and it's funny because in Kingdom Hearts, you know, the, the Keyblade was supposed to go to Riku, but because of the darkness, mm. you know, it passed to Sora instead. And it's like, you know, Riku could be jealous of Sora, but it's like, well, you could have just done the right thing and you would have gotten the Keyblade anyway. Mm -hmm. so. And when he eventually did do the right thing, he got his Keyblade. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there you go. David explained it way better than me. <laughs> I think it was a That's collaborative effort. I think it was a collaborative <laughs> effort and you both did a phenomenal job. job. Better than I could have. And that's <laughs> exactly, you. again, why you're here. Um, <laughs> we're coming up on time a little bit. We definitely still mm -hmm. got some time left, but I haven't asked you guys and I try to ask everyone. So we live in an age where there's a bottomless pit of media to consume and fall in love with. So I'll ask you both individually, why Kingdom Hearts? cool it's a great question so i yeah i don't know i feel like for me it's just stuck around but i mean i've gone away and come back it's like a journey yeah my kingdom hearts journey is like i started out good and then i fell away and then i came back <laughs> it's pretty much like the Christian walk. No, okay. So, um, when I was in high school, I think I've I've said this on uh on my podcast before, but like, um, basically, uh, my my sister was playing it with some kid from her school. I don't even remember who it was, and I and I just walked in and I was like, "Yo, like, what what the heck is this?" And it was just the the art like really popped out to me because um, I think I've said this before, but like, I think. Before that, I'd only ever played like, I don't know, Crash Bandicoot or things like that, which are fun and what have you. But like Kingdom Hearts is like cinematic in a way that I'd never experienced a game to be before. Like I've never played an RPG in my life really before that. Um, and I was just like, wow, like I didn't know games could be like this, <laughs> you know, like so yeah. big and like you can do all these different things and go to different like worlds and all that. Um, and so I think I just fell in love with the scale of Kingdom Hearts, if that makes sense. That makes perfect um, sense, yeah. At, at, at that time. But I think the reason that um, that I'm still playing it all these years later um, is really just the emotional bond between the characters. I really appreciate that, um, seeing them all grow. And um, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just always excited for more. Like, I'm just always excited to see what's going to happen and where it's going to go. And um, <laughs> it's funny because, I mean, I watched the, uh, the new cross update the other day, but, um, and I don't feel like <laughs> I really, um, I don't know. I feel like I'm just hopping on the train at like the last minute and it's, <laughs> um, it's a lot so to I digest. Yes. So I'm just jumping on this hype train. I don't feel like I'm going to change my Thing on Twitter to have the little asterisks because I'm like that'll make me look like a huge Unicross fan and I'm you know I'm just jumping on the train now so I feel like that's unfair to the people that have actually invested their time um to to the grind who mm -hmm. have actually committed to the grind but um no it's just it's fun and I think that now that I'm involved in the community I just I love the community surrounding Kingdom Hearts as well and like the people that are so passionate about these games I feel like it just really brings people together so yeah that's my thing i guess <laughs> <laughs> i think uh kingdom hearts 
is beautiful aesthetically um, yeah. and it's just got everything there's uh, lore great characters uh, romance mystery um, it, it's got you know I think everything we long for in, in story in art uh, in games uh, there's a, it, it hits on so many like we said big powerful archetypes mm -hmm. uh, that really resonate with people and I also think that, that it also touched on something that hasn't been done well in a while um, I think the closest thing I could we said this last time when, when we interviewed you on, on our podcast, the closest thing I could compare Kingdom Hearts to is like Lost, mm -hmm. uh, the TV show Lost, mm -hmm. um, but like with like the heavy lore of like Lord of the Rings um, and that combined with Disney, with nostalgia, um, Disney is also very heavy on the, the archetypes, uh, the movies that we grew up watching. Um, so yeah, I just think it, it resonates resonates with me and I think with a lot of other people on a very deep level yeah yeah I'm, I'm one of them I'm one of them there's <laughs> there's truly there's truly nothing like it um it, it's such a beautiful story beautiful aesthetically the music is out of this world oh, we um, love the music. That, right there's there's just so much to love and there's so much to look forward to and to see it to see it have grown as much as it has the last 20 years like there are a lot of properties that I've loved that have just fallen by the wayside but Kingdom Hearts is obviously doing something right because it's bigger than it's ever been. Right. Um, we're wrapping up here. Um, before we wrap up, I want to direct everybody, if you haven't already, please follow the Kingdom Minds podcast. I got links in the episode's descriptions for you. Um, you can find them on all the podcasting platforms, Spotify, Apple, they're all there. Um, you guys really do a great job. It's really something else to listen to. Um, it's refreshing, you know, there's a lot of, you know, a lot, and we're all guilty of it. Sometimes we, we, we consume media that's uh, kind of brain dead, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. and, 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 you know, to hear you guys taking something like Kingdom Hearts and attaching all of these, you know, deep ancient ideas to it and just discussing it openly and having a good time. It's a very good vibe. I highly recommend it to anyone um but an, enough of uh, my vocal ear beating is there anything the two of you want to say um before we put the curtains up i just want to say thank you so much for having us on as well i feel like um yeah landy i feel like you get what we're about and i feel like that's really cool i feel like we're like kindred spirit creators oh, <laughs> like oh, i feel yes. like we're on a wave <laughs> like like i feel like because there's people that i've talked to and i'm like yeah i've got a kingdom arts podcast but we also talk about like god and stuff and they're like why ah. <laughs> 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 so it's really fun to like have like to know people that like get it and i think that's really cool so and i feel like what you're doing with your show is really fun and in a very similar way like you're discussing a lot of cool um theories but also like awesome ideas i think that's fun too yeah, yeah. we enjoy I mean, it so i'm gonna say the same thing um yeah i feel like we're we're, we're kindred spirits um i really appreciate you having us um so thanks that's it's it's my pleasure i mean when i can when i heard about just the concept of your guys podcast i was like oh well that that it's there there's not anyone doing what you guys are doing and that, that that's another thing is you guys are very unique to your own you've got you've got your own little niche going on and i think it's it's a joy to listen to it was a joy to take part in thank you for having me on you guys are always welcome here we'll thank have to you. do it again um fine. but without further ado thank you to the kingdom minds pod for stepping in the lodge please follow these two you can find the i've said i've said it a million times links are in the <laughs> description they're there for you Take care, everybody. Be good. Thanks. Thank you.